Okay. Yes. Uh, let's walk on hands. Is my slide visible? Yes. Yes. Can you see my slide? Yes. Can you see my slides? Yes. Start, thanks. We can see slides. Please start. Okay. So, thank you for uh, having me virtually. It would be nice to be in person and have some uh, opportunity in the future. I want to talk about the multipath propagation of FLBs as a tool for uncovering the properties of extragram plasma. This is work done with uh, Pawan Kumar and Ramesh Narayan. And I want to start with uh, sort of a very brief introduction as to why FLBs. I think a good cosmological box. Uh, we've heard quite a lot about that already, but uh, just to summarize it in my ABCD of FOB cosmology, they are extremely abundant. If we're talking about uh, the rate uh, of uh, FOBs per sky per day, it's about 10 to the power about some uh, very decent uh, fluid special. They're very bright. If you scale uh, FOBs with no redshift up to high redshifts, you find that a very large fraction of them is going to be detectable, even from those larger objects. They're cosmological, there are very good reasons to expect that these bursts happen, uh, even at uh, very large objects. Uh, and for each and every burst we measure, we measure the dispersion measure, which gives us uh, the column of uh, free electrons between us and the source. And that is very useful. One famous application of this is uh, this plot uh, where uh, a number of repeaters were used uh, very famously to obtain uh, the barium content of the universe, uh, and this is under the assumption that this dispersion measure is dominated by IgM propagation. What I want to mention today in this context is that uh, one very exciting frontier in terms of FLB cosmology is hydrogen realization. So the nice thing about hydrogen realization, the epoch of hydrogen realization of the universe, is that once you go beyond that epoch of the universe, you run out of free electrons. Meaning that if you think of different realization histories as shown here on the right hand side, and you integrate over the number of free electrons that you have, you will get a different amount of maximum dispersion measure as shown here on the left. So different realization history correspond to different DM max, and therefore the fact that you have this plateauing of the M and the fact that the plateau itself is different between different histories means that by measuring this plateau, you can have access to precise information about the realization history. And uh, in this work uh, that we did a couple of years ago now, we showed various ways in which uh, this information can be obtained uh, under different uh, conditions. I just want to very briefly em emphasize some of the results of this work. So one thing is that uh, one can show that this DMX is highly correlated with the optical depth to Thomson scattering, for example, from the CMB, so from very large uh, redshift. And because of that, by measuring the max precisely, and precisely here only means to the extent of 500 parsec per centimeter cube, you can already improve on the state-of-the-art constraints from the Planck experiment. So this is very remarkable. 500 parsec per centimeter cube is really not that much in order to compete with uh, in such uh, an amazing experiment. Also, if you have even just a few tens of FLBs uh, with measured redshift in the range of a uh, hydrogen realization between redshift uh, 6 and 10, that's enough to constrain the history of hydrogen realization very precisely to a level of a few percent. Even if you have FLBs with no redshift, once you detect enough of them, you can see here on the right hand side the distribution of number of detected bursts per dispersion measure is different for different realization histories. Uh, so you can see here uh, in solid and in dotted lines different histories. And because of that, uh, we can tell the difference between those histories. Uh, once we detect enough bursts, you see these interesting features that appear large dispersion measure in terms of uh, the distribution. It could be a plateau or even a sharp one. Next, I, I want to move to a topic that is actually very uh, highly related to what Wayne Penn was just talking about. And I completely agree that uh, scintillation and plasma scattering is one of the frontiers for uh, FOBs at the moment. And uh, this is, if you want, a sort of second order effect to what I talked about uh, up until this point. I talked about the first order, which is just the uh, DM in itself, 
uh, assuming no uh, variability. But now we take into account the fact that uh, the medium, the plasma through which the FPB radio waves are passing, uh, could be inhomogeneous and uh, it could be turbulent and therefore it could cause scattering and scintillation. So this was already introduced, so I will not spend too much time on this. The effects of spectral decoherence, shown here on the right, scatter modeling on the left. In principle, you can even induce temporal variability on the light curve, although this typically happens on time scales that are longer than what is seen in uh, FOBs. There is a fourth effect that I want to mention here today, which I think is very interesting. And this is the effect that uh, a scattering screen that the radio waves are passing through can affect the polarization. And uh, I want to argue that understanding this is uh, important if we want to disentangle the properties of the source from those of propagation. This will uh, allow us to learn better about both the source and the emission mechanism and about the intervening plasma between us and the FOP sources. The general result that you get out of this is that you can uh, cause two main effects which can happen independently from each other. You can cause the radio waves to become partially depolarized under certain conditions, and you can cause a large fraction of the polarization, say if it was initially linearly depolarized, to be converted to circular polarization. There are also unique dependencies of these effects coming from uh, depolarization by multipath propagation as a function of frequency and time. And I want to emphasize that these are distinct from other effects that you may have heard of regarding depolarization or circular polarization, such as depolarization due to a large but finite rotation measure, or a typically small circular polarization that can be gener uh, generated from a generalized Faraday rotation. So in one slide, kind of how it, this works, you can imagine the situation as following. There is an incoming electromagnetic wave, shown here on the right-hand side. Then there is the plasma screen, which I've compressed to a 2D plane. And at each point on the screen, you get some amount of rotation of the wave, and you also accumulate some phase. Part of it because of the fact that plasma is turbulent, and you accumulate different amounts of phase through different lines going through the screen. And part of it because of simply the geometrical effect, how far it is above the line of sight. Combining these things together, you have this uh, fernay kirchhoff integral, which tells you what the electric field is at the observer location. And here, if you are in a situation where the plasma fluctuations happen on a small enough scale compared to the typical uh, geometric size of the screen, which is the Fresnel radius, then you're in the limit of strong scattering. In this limit, the visible size of the screen is much greater than the Fresnel radius. And what you see effectively is contribution from places where this uh, exponent here uh, is uh, highly oscillating. So you see contribution from multiple bright spots on the screen. This means that to first order, we can uh, approximate the situation as a sort of multi-slit experiment. And the simplest version of this that maintains the essence is a two-slit experiment. So you can imagine this following very simple setup. You start with a linearly polarized wave coming from above, and then with each of the slits, you change its uh, rotation angle, its angle of the electric uh, field vector, and the phase. And then you combine things back at the observer, and you see what the polarization is that you get. So it's shown here in terms of Stokes parameter, and you see that generally you convert order unity fraction of the polarization into a circular component in this way. One can also work out the effect on depolarization. I don't have time to show this uh, today, so I will just show you directly the result. So this is this equation that you see here on the bottom right side. You see that it's relatively compact and uh, relatively easy to uh, understand analytically. These are also the numerical results shown for the linear polarization on the left, circular polarization on the right, uh, and uh, in this parameter space that has to do with the uh, uh, temporal and spectral resolution of the detector. Just a couple of things to point out here. One is that uh, there's an interesting effect here where the uh, temporal variability, if it is induced by the source, or if it is induced by the screen, meaning the eddies in the screen are moving, or the whole screen is moving relative to the line of sight, this affects the observed polarization differently. So actually, uh, this could be an interesting tool to uh, distinguish between those two options. And also, I want to emphasize the fact that you can have a large fraction of circular polarization 
be obtained due to this process, even in situations here on the bottom right uh, side of these two plots where there is no depolarization. So these two effects are indeed coupled, like I mentioned before. If you want uh, another look at this, these are uh, typical parameters that give you typical ISM-like plasma splits. So two different examples here. And you see some of the different length scales in the problem and how they scale with frequency and correspondingly the characteristic frequencies in the problem. So below this typical frequency you have strong scattering where you can start having these strong effects. And you see that generally there is another frequency of interest uh, which is where you can start seeing circular polarization induced by the screen. Uh, and all of these effects become more pronounced as you go to the lower frequency. Okay. Uh, this uh, also shows you when the depolarization, the different uh, effects on depolarization can happen. Again, this happens more pronounced at lower frequencies. And putting everything together, uh, you see this in terms of the linear polarization here in the solid line and the circular polarization here in the dotted line for these two examples. So you see that there is rich phenomenology and we can understand uh, all of this uh, quite well. There are different interesting regimes. If you're interested, I encourage you to go and look at the paper. One paper uh, of this that uh, we did uh, recently was to this now famous burst 1905-20. This is a very interesting burst. It shows depolarization at the low frequency band of the slightly higher one. It has a large and very uh, highly fluctuating rotation measure, as shown here on the figure. And it shows strong signs of scintillation. It turns out that uh, this burst both Quantitatively and qualitatively is consistent with the predictions from this multipath depolarization picture that I just showed you. And in this specific case, for example, we can infer the size and the distance of the stream, which happens to be very close to the source, up to about 100 parsec from the source, and therefore constrains the nature uh, of the source and the geometry. Uh, two last comments before I conclude are about uh, combining plasma scattering with gravitational density. So if you have a source that is left, these effects that I just told you about can be pronounced, and you can do them even if uh, the medium that the radio waves are passing through is completely non-turbulent. And the second point I want to make relates to the first part of my talk, and this is that if you have a lens FOB, under certain conditions, you will be able to see it as two separate, uh, temporally separate uh, bursts, and uh, you will be able to measure the dispersion measure for each one. This will mean that effectively you are measuring the difference in dispersion measure on tiny angular scales, something like 10 to the minus 6, which at cosmological distances corresponds to kiloparsec scale. So we will never get this level of accuracy with just randomly looking at different bursts along the sky uh, from any given region. So this allows us to have really good angular resolution of the dispersion measure and can constrain very interesting properties uh, such as uh, fluctuations in DMIGM and maybe even the structure of realization bubbles. Okay, so since I'm out of time, I will just leave you with my conclusion. Thank, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pat. Any questions? Done. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, it's done and then we. Yeah, this was a fascinating talk, Dan Steinberg. And, um, I'm not familiar with this work. I need to read read up on this. I wonder if you could just go back to um, one of your Kirchhoff integral slides because I'm I'm missing your point about the induced circular polarization, which is your key a key point. I mean, I'm used to thinking of generalized Faraday rotation and and just continuing the loop around between linear and circular, and I don't. Uh, I don't understand the, the fundamental, why do you end up with the predominant circular polarization? Yeah, thank you for the question. Indeed, it's very different than uh, generalized Faraday okay. rotation, where you uh, have this fluctuation between uh, linear and circular polarization. So the idea here is the following. You have a screen, and at each point in the screen, uh, because the plasma is turbulent, you get a different uh, change to the phase uh, of the electromagnetic wave as you propagate through the screen, and you get a different amount of rotation. Essentially, the, uh, the integral uh, of the dispersion relation gives you a different amount of phase here and a different amount of uh, rotation angle from each of those different points in the screen. 
So if you look at the terms in the exponent, this is this phi, this is the phase right. that is spatially dependent on the position of the string. And this uh, is the electric field which has been rotated by this matrix relative to the incoming one, again by an amount that is dependent on the position of the string. So uh, now... The, this, this I'm sorry, this, this part I'm familiar with. In the next slide, uh, maybe in the next slide, uh, you go to the uh, polarization? Yeah, so now essentially the, the point is that we have these bright spots that contribute. Once you have these bright spots, so you can think of them as these slits, where each slit changes the rotation by some amount and changes the phase by some amount. So in this example, I took a linearly polarized wave, I pass it through the slit, and then uh, I have these two different components, which are the results of uh, uh, this is uh, projected on uh, two uh, uh, on uh, two axes, say uh, x and y, uh, as a result of passing through slit A and slit B. And then I simply uh, get the Stokes parameters out of uh, this electric field. And uh, you can see that the V component, which is uh, where the circular polarization is, uh, depends on the sign of the difference in phase between the two slits and sign of the difference in rotation between the two slits. And generally, this can be of order unity, this delta phi and delta chi. Once we're talking about, uh, I mean, two slits that are uh, removed by a sufficient amount in the screen, uh, this can be, in principle, of order unity or much more, uh, and uh, therefore the sign will be of order, of order unity, and uh, we get a V component that is of order V hydrogen. Okay, well thank you for going over that. I still need to think about it and talk with, other, talk with you and other people. Sure. Yeah, so I guess we've looked at this, and uh, so has our late friend J.P. McCart. I'm not quite sure how yours differs from his analysis that he did for his PhD thesis. But in our estimates, we find that the leading effect is a constant magnetic field, because as we know that in our galaxy and in many systems, the B mean is bigger than the delta B, or at least is comparable. In which case, all that happens is that, the, as, as Dan described, the dispersion delay is slightly different from left and right circularly polarized waves. So all you get is you get a shift of the left polarized dynamic spectrum and the right polarized dynamic spectrum by delta um, plasma, uh, delta, sorry, uh, what's it called, uh, cyclotron frequency split. And if you just correlate it, like Lee et al. did, you get to measure the magnetic, mean magnetic field just by doing the left to right frequency shift correlation. And then the next leading effect, if you, look at, if you just estimate magnetic fields, what we think we know about them is a gradient. And a gradient is called a Faraday wedge. And Faraday wedge just causes your left and right polarizations to shift in angle or therefore in time. So if you do a time correlation of your left and right dynamic spectra, you will see a tiny shift which has been detected. So both of these effects are measurable and leading, and I think they're known to be leading. So it seems to me a relatively simple, nature is relatively kind to us that I think these depolarization effects seem to be relatively easy to understand and measure, so I think it's good. By the way, I think it's important and I encourage people to do these things. People often don't look at the polarization data in left and right and do those correlations. And I think, that I, again, another, another coherent effect that is very important. Thank you. Okay. I agree, by the way, that in many cases the uh, field, uh, the, uh, the non-fluctuating part of the magnetic field dominates. Uh, in fact, if you see this uh, new chi s that I have here, essentially this is what goes into it. The fact that you can show that the length scale associated with two paths in the stream having changed the rotation of the electric field vector by a significant amount between them is always larger than the length scale associated with the phase changing by a significant amount. So this scale that has to do with rotation of the electric field is uh, the scale is always greater than the diffraction scale. Now, the critical issue is whether this scale is smaller or greater than the refractive scale. It's always greater than the diffractive scale, but there is a large range of parameters scale where it's uh, still smaller than the refractive scale, and that's where all these things happen. But even when this does not happen, then uh, other effects are still important, and uh, where you just mentioned the uh, Okay, thank you, Pat. Let's pass again.